Contented Media presents Dr. Bitcoin, the man who wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto, an original podcast series with Mark Hunter and Arthur Van Pelt. Hello and welcome to Dr. Bitcoin, the man who wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto, and an update on the Tulip Trading Limited, or TTL, versus Bitcoin developers lawsuit. This case is one of those not bound by the outcome of the Copa case because it doesn't rely on Craig Wright being Satoshi Nakamoto, but a victory for Wright would be no less impactful. With me, as ever, to go over the latest developments is Arthur Van Pelt. Arthur, Santa really has delivered us one hell of a Christmas present here, hasn't he? <laughs> oh yeah, say that again, Mark. Hmm. We just became aware of uh, a few filings, three I think, and uh, and a ruling in the pineapple hack uh, or or the fiduciary duties uh, case. And in this uh, episode, we will go to the bottom of these uh, things. Yes, indeed. Now this case has slipped under the radar a little due to the Copa case grabbing all the headlines. So can you give us an overview of this case, please? Oh yeah, sure. It's straightforward about. Uh, well, that's what Craig Wright uh, at least uh, claims, <laughs> a theft of uh, 110,000 uh, Bitcoins and the same coins uh, from uh, forks of Bitcoin, like Bitcoin Cash, BSV and eCash. And it, he was hacked from his home by means of a pineapple device that was uh, used uh, to hack his network. Uh, I think it was in February 2020. Mm -hmm. And if we have to believe uh, Craig's uh, story, the pineapple hack device was planted behind his TV in some uh, Ocean's Eleven style uh, break in <laughs> into his house. Mm -hmm. And then his uh, digital assets were uh, drained from his uh, network. Now, after discovery of uh, this theft, Craig deleted all the evidence of this hack. He deleted the uh, potential backups. He also claimed uh, that his service providers had no backups due to uh, disruptions uh, of their services. Now, yeah, so to cut a long story short, it ended up that he sued uh, the Bitcoin developers, the BCH developers, the BSV Association, and some developers from eCash. Now, what Craig wants is their help uh, to get back uh, access to these tokens on the addresses uh, that we now call 1FIX and 12IB7. At first, there was a judge that thought that the case had no merits, so Craig lost when his uh, fiduciary duties case was kicked out. We know Craig, of course, uh, mm. so he appealed and he won actually that appeal in February of this year, 2023. Mm -hmm. But our listeners will uh, not be surprised uh, to hear that the Bitcoin developers uh, found a lot of uh, forgeries and bookkeeping fraud in Craig's evidence when uh, the case was uh, continued. This reminds us of uh, the Wright versus uh, McCormack uh, libel case. That was also a case with false evidence and the judge had said in his ruling that if he knew uh, earlier about uh, the false evidence of uh, Craig Wright, then he would have kicked out uh, the case from the start. So what I'm curious about, will that happen now also? Hmm. Remains to be seen. Well, let's crack on with this extraordinary update. On July 11th, 2023, the defendants, known as the Enyo defendants, filed a request that the judge order a preliminary trial to determine whether TTL actually owned the coins it said was stolen from it before any full trial take place, claiming that TTL, quote, never owned the digital assets and has commenced this claim fraudulently and in reliance on fabricated documents, unquote. It added the following, quote, the Enyo defendant's defence raises a threshold issue which by its nature requires determination before this case proceeds any further because if TTL has commenced these proceedings knowing that it has no claim in respect of the digital assets and has fabricated documents to support this false claim, it necessarily follows that this claim is an abusive process and should be struck out. Even leaving aside the issue of abusive process, the issue of whether TTL owns the digital assets in respect of which it sues goes directly to its standing to bring the claim at all." Unquote. The developers also asked to have the entire case thrown out based on new evidence it had received, including what appeared to be doctored accounting records which showed TTL backdating ownership of the 1FIX and 12IB7 coins in its accounts. TTL countered by arguing that certain evidence used by the developers in calling for the preliminary trial, split into two packages called the Hollington material and the irrelevant material, should be struck out. Arthur, what was included in the Hollington material? 
that Hollington material relates to all the evidence that the Bitcoin developers wanted to throw in the case about Craig's and then I will uh, use a quote, his history of fraud, forgery and dishonesty. Specifically, the Hollington material refers to and relies on alleged findings in alleged judgments and decisions from cases involving different parties in uh, yeah, Australia and the United States, in Norway and England and Wales, of course, as well as findings from the Australian uh, Taxation Office. So what the developers wanted they wanted to grab all that uh, juicy quotes from other rulings and uh, findings all over the world and to show the judge, in this case, that Craig Wright is actually a very naughty boy. <laughs> Wright's camp called the Hollington material, quote, alleged factual findings in previous judicial and quasi-judicial proceedings involving different parties, unquote, and as a result, it should be, quote, struck out as lacking any or sufficient relevance, unquote. They also added that the material would, quote, require detailed and comprehensive rebutting by TTL in the event that the allegations were not to be struck out. That would be an extremely time-consuming, distracting and costly exercise, unquote. They also labelled it, rather amusingly, quote, an unsubtle attempt to vex Dr. Wright, unquote, and noted that similar material was blocked from the Wright versus Coinbase case. Wright's team also wanted what was termed by the defendants the irrelevant material also struck out. This was evidence that the developers believed undermined TTL's claim to own the coins, namely evidence that it claimed had been forged or doctored. TTL wanted the courts to go through the defendants' evidence and surrounding claims supporting the preliminary trial line by line and redact anything that it felt was a step too far, but the defendants argued that this was, quote, not an appropriate case management exercise, unquote. The judge overseeing this stage of the case, Justice Miller, who is also overseeing the Coper versus Craig Wright trial, ruled on the matter on October the 3rd, but not before Wright's team could abandon their attempt to get the irrelevant material struck out, although they still deemed it irrelevant to the preliminary trial. Justice Miller noted how for most of the day-long hearing he was, quote, inclined to accede to TTL's application and strike out the Hollington material, not only on the grounds of inadmissibility but also irrelevance, unquote. However, he was swayed by an argument made by Sebastian Isaac for the defendants and summarised, quote, Whilst one must guard against conducting any sort of mini-trial, the stronger the case on ownership and fraud is, the greater the reason to order a preliminary trial is. The evidence would stay in. Two weeks after this ruling, Wright entered his fifth and sixth witness statements, which threw up some pretty spectacular changes in story. These changes were responded to by Enyo's lawyer Timothy Ellis two weeks later. So, Arthur, I'll read out Wright's claims and you can tell us what Enyo said. How's that? Yep, let's go. Okay, so the first thing we'll tackle is the one fix address. Wright's witness statements provided us with an updated story over the purchasing of the OneFeeks address, with Wright starting out by acknowledging that WMIRK, the web money exchanger which allegedly conducted the purchase for him, didn't sell Bitcoin in 2011. Quote, in February 2011, it is accurate to acknowledge that WMIRK did not commonly offer trading services for Bitcoin. My familiarity with WMIRK stemmed from my background in the gaming industry, and I contacted them by telephone to explore the possibility of assisting with the acquisition of the OneFeex assets. My purchase of the OneFeex assets in February 2011 essentially represented a test transaction, and at a later date, WMIRK established a more substantial online trading practice. Unquote. Arthur, there are so many things wrong with this, but Timothy Ellis nailed them all, didn't he? Oh yeah, he certainly did. He's really into the case, you can see that. Mm. And I hope you don't mind uh, if I quote uh, a full passage again, uh, Mark, because it's so perfect. It's so perfect. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wright's account of what happened is entirely implausible. Dr. Wright now adds to that account that the transaction that he affected was a test transaction. If WMIRK were not trading Bitcoin, as Dr. Wright accepts, WMIRK, that uh, Russian exchange, would have needed to decide whether it had the capability and interest to broker the trade. Once it had done that, it would need to determine whether it could in fact identify a trading partner and the prices that it was going to offer. The trade would then need to be confirmed. Dr. Wright will have needed to transfer the Liberty Dollars to WMIRK and communicate the Bitcoin address running to 
34 cases specific characters with no errors which we know he didn't do <laughs> yeah crazy dr wright says that this entire process happened over the telephone between australia and russia in a language he fails to identify without <laughs> generating a single documentary record this defies belief in this regard it is notable that the dr wright misstates the one fix address which would cause an invalid address error and over the phone would require rereading the entire address over and over again to figure out what characters <laughs> were wrong <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah Brilliant. he has done so in other evidence filed in these proceedings demonstrating the difficulties involved in correctly specifying a case sensitive public key of that length there you go mark i mean he's absolutely right can you just imagine him reading one by one this this bitcoin addresses over the phone then realizing they got it wrong and doing it all over again and checking it is just it's so implausible so implausible yeah absolutely i was even imagining that when it is about the one fix address there's also if i remember well um not only the one fix address i think it was an address that he said that was appointed to him by this russian exchange so he also they had to give him the private key of that address <laughs> letter by letter that means that they were talking on the phone and a private key is not 34 it's even way longer Jeez, yeah. and way more difficult to communicate over over a phone line so it's it's probably not only the one fixed address it's also the private key that they had to exchange over the phone and i mean come on yeah never happened let's not forget too that craig wright claims that this was an otc deal and that he made a conscious choice to massively overpay for these coins i mean 1.68 million dollars as opposed to the market value of seventy two thousand dollars by claiming there was no market value at the time i mean mount gox and bitcoin market would beg to differ on that front and that he wanted to pay over the odds to assist with his battle against the ato which is just too ludicrous to go into he also said that he paid 22 times the going rate, quote, in order to generate a healthier Bitcoin market, unquote. But Arthur, can an OTC deal stimulate the market? It's designed to be invisible, isn't it? Well, yeah, sure, of course. It's, it's invisible to the, to the market of day traders on, uh, on exchanges. Because OTC, that means over the counter, and that are transactions that are not found in the order books of uh, exchanges where day traders buy and sell uh, yeah, they, they, they take uh, offers and honor offers uh, every second of the day almost. So, for example, when a miner has gathered uh, 1000 uh, BTC from his mining business and he doesn't want to sell this BTC in the open market because of uh, fees and slippage and inexperience with uh, exchanges, then, uh, of course, he will try uh, to contact an OTC dealer and leave the selling uh, uh, to this dealer who works on a commission base. Now, in the moment that such a dealer has arranged a sales of, uh, yeah, let's uh, take that example of 1000 uh, BTC to a party like, uh, well, these days, uh, MicroStrategy, for example, is uh, probably buying OTC uh, a lot, uh, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the miner will straight away send uh, the BTC to MicroStrategy, probably, of course, with, a, with an escrow arrangement uh, in between. But again, and, uh, these deals are nowhere to be found in order books, yeah, let alone in uh, daily trading volumes of exchanges. They're, they're just operating outside uh, the market. It's, uh, s uh, we know that it exists, but we don't know the numbers because it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's not secret, it's not hidden, but it, it's a market that is not public. Let's, let's call it like that. Wright had also claimed that the Liberty Reserve dollars he allegedly used to pay with weren't priced at $1 each, hence the odd transaction value, but hasn't provided any proof of price fluctuations, especially not to the extent he needs to back up this claim. Wright also dealt with some criticism of the purchase order for the coins, the details of which we outlined in a previous update on this case in June. Wright had submitted the purchase order as evidence of purchase, but this was exposed as a forgery by Timothy Ellis in his earlier witness statements, citing multiple issues with the document itself and its provenance. In his October 2023 witness statements, Wright disowned the purchase order and laid all the blame for the inaccuracies at the door of his ex-wife, Lynn Wright, who he says knocked it up after the deal was done on the phone, despite the pair being in the middle of an acrimonious divorce at the time. 
In his witness statement, Wright clarified that Lynn kept the purchase order as part of their divorce due to its association with a company with which she was left saddled after the divorce, with Wright only getting access to it again in December 2012. Wright also acknowledged that he didn't have a native Excel version of the purchase order because, of course, Lynn Wright had done it all, and then went on to say that an Excel version wouldn't have been produced anyway because it was done through Wright's accounting software, MYOB, adding that the metadata of any printout will show the date of the printout, not the date of the entry creation, hence any discrepancies. So, Arthur, that's all cleared up then? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, this is not cleared up at all, uh, Mark. <laughs> let's let's go back to uh, to this Alice uh, document again. Yeah, that's uh, Alice's uh, sixth witness statement, where it says none of these explanations make any sense at all, and then he gives uh, three very important reasons why uh, Crick's uh, claims are nonsense. Because firstly, Alice says. It is entirely unclear what purpose a purchase order prepared after the event and not sent to WMIRK would serve. As Dr. Wright rightly recognizes, one might expect WMIRK to send an invoice recording the relevant transaction, but no such document has been produced. Secondly, Alice uh, says that the purchase order uh, remained in Lynn Wright's control throughout their separation in December 2010. Now, yeah, this cannot be right, of course, because the document, as Craig says, wasn't prepared until February 2011. So how could Lynn Wright have it three months uh, earlier? Mm -hmm. And third, Craig doesn't address the issue of the purchase order template only being released in 2015. And Alice also says that he fails to grapple with how a purchase order based on that template can be said to have been created in MIOB. And that was the bookkeeping system of uh, Craig Wright. Mm -hmm. Now, that cannot have been uh, the case. Now, and so Alice, in summing up, says that uh, Craig now expressly disclaims reliance on the purchase order as a contemporaneous document, despite his own forensic teams dating it to 2011. So he has hired his own people, he got their report and entered it into evidence only to then totally discount it when <laughs> the flaws are picked out. And Mr. Ellis ends by saying, it is not credible that this is a forgery created by anyone other than Dr. Wright. Hmm. But we're not done with the purchase order yet. Wright, in typical fashion, threw his previous counsel under the bus. Quote, I understand a previous statement in these proceedings provided by my previous lawyer's entier confirmed that the purchase order was a contemporaneous document. This is incorrect. As set out more detail later in this statement, the MYOB accounting platform is the original source of the transaction data. Ontier had been instructed to use their access to the MYOB accounting platform to extract the verified contemporaneous records of the purchase. This is not what occurred. For the avoidance of doubt, TTL's position is not that the purchase order represents contemporaneous proof of the transaction." Unquote. Craig Wright also dismissed the numerous errors on the purchase order, which included the one fix address, the WMIRK logo, the mining fee levied by WMIRK, the exchange rate and more, again blaming Lynn Wright, which suggests she either intentionally did all these things to back up Wright's ownership claims, or somehow accidentally made a plethora of errors that Wright didn't notice, even when it came to submitting it as evidence. So, Arthur, here's Craig Wright washing his hands of a key piece of evidence once it's been found wanting, and of course blaming someone else. What did Ellis make of this? Now, he calls it an, uh, an, a serious allegation if true, but one that isn't supported by any evidence and is flatly inconsistent with Dr. Wright's own evidence in support of TTL's claim. And he adds that having made these concessions, TTL is left with no contemporaneous evidence of its ownership of the digital assets. So, oops. <laughs> Back in the day when it was still representing Wright, Ontier had told the court that Wright's accounting software showed, quote, that the WII, Wright International Investments, entity, recorded the receipt of 79,956 Bitcoin as inventory on 26th of February 2011. However, Ontia noted at the time that there were, quote, some inconsistencies within the accounting records, unquote, which might have precipitated the law firm's downfall. What really did for Wright, however, was evidence submitted in the COPA trial by Craig Wright. Arthur, how did Craig Wright undermine his own claims here? Oh, yeah. 
Ja, dat is een pretty funny anecdote. <laughs> This was explained by Alice in an earlier statement. That was in his third witness statement. And in short, it goes like this. There was an email in the COPA case dated April 17, 2020 from Craig Wright to Enchain CTO Steve Shadows. Now, that email had a zip file as an attachment. And in that zip file, Craig had dropped bookkeeping data from MIOB. Now, because the exact same Bitcoin developers are involved in the other halted lawsuits around the COPA case, they received these updates from the COPA case and they asked permission if that email could also be used as evidence in the pineapple hack case. And surprisingly, Craig gave this permission. So now the Bitcoin developers were able to forensically investigate that email with a zip file. And guess what? Now I will let Alice tell, uh, tell the story, so I will quote from him. <laughs> It is possible to extract a journal security audit from the MIOB data, which includes details of when relevant transactions were entered into the MIOB software by using functionality within the software. The journal security audit log indicates that all of the entries of the acquisitions of the one fix address were entered into MIOB on the 7th of March of 2020, <laughs> not in 2011 <laughs> or 2014. Craig strikes again. This is bookkeeping fraud, actually, really. Yeah. As mentioned above, Ontier, on the instructions of TTL and Dr. Wright, instructed Alex partners to give forensic accounting evidence on TTL's ownership of the digital assets for the purpose of bringing these proceedings in February of 2020. These entries were therefore made after Alex partners had been instructed, but before the .myox file was provided hmm. to Alex partners. No etc etc and then Alice continues the evidence I have set out above supports the inference that Dr. Wright misled Alex partners and Ontier by presenting them with supposedly contemporaneous evidence of his ownership and then used the same false contemporaneous evidence and the conclusions of Alex partners based on it to mislead the court in these proceedings wow boom Big charge. Yeah, this this is a bomb dropping. Mm. There we go, Mark. Craig is tying himself up in uh, knots as he tries to keep uh, the lies consistent uh, between uh, the cases. And I think this is a good time to remember that line from uh, Sir Walter Scott. <laughs> Not Shakespeare, as many believe, but uh, Sir Walter Scott, that Judge Bloom uh, quoted uh, during the climate trial. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Mm. And I think it's quite fitting here, uh, Mark. Yeah, definitely. Now we move on to the 12 Ib7 address, where Wright dropped another bombshell. Quote, TTL's position on the 12 Ib7 assets is that these assets were also purchased under my direction. I was not, however, involved in the day-to-day -day management or accounts for TTL or Wright International Investments Limited, so cannot be certain as to the date or method of acquisition, but would assume, given the market at the time, that these were also purchased through WMIRK. I believe the purchase would have been in mid-2010. A transfer upon purchase will be recorded on the blockchain. Arthur, this really is the best that Craig Wright can do. I don't think we need to even go to Ellis here for a breakdown of the issues. It's just lazy, isn't it? Yeah, this claim is uh, rubbish again, of course. We just heard that uh, Craig is now claiming that the March 2011 transaction with WMIRK was the first test transaction. And then he comes up with a second transaction about a year earlier to obtain uh, the tokens on, uh, on the 12 IB7 address. And that transaction was also with WMIRK. Uh, that's at least what Craig is saying. So he is immediately throwing uh, the test transaction in uh, 2011 overboard with his uh, next lie. <laughs> And what is also good to mention here is that back in 2013, uh, that's, when, uh, that's when Craig was having his Bitcoin address uh, issues with ATO. And you know what happened then, uh, Mark. So I'll read it for you. Mm -hmm. On 10 of October 2013, Dr. Wright emailed the ATO suggesting that the 12 IB7 and the one fix addresses were now under his control as a matter of fate and other circumstances. <laughs> fate. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, so he did not tell the ATO that he got these addresses or any Bitcoin addresses at all from WMIRK. No. 
So it's it's the <laughs> it's the number umpteen uh, example of uh, Craig uh, changing his mind at uh, the last minute and. Yeah, that's why we have these accusations of uh, unsatisfactory or fraudulent uh, evidence. Mm. Wright's only contemporaneous evidence for his 12 IB-7 purchase has been his MYOB records. But following Ellis's letter to Wright's newly installed law firm, Travis Smith, in September, Wright disowned the MYOB data too. Quote, The MYOB records referred to were generated for the purpose of separate legal proceedings in Florida. The indicative records were generated by my previous solicitors on TALLP and without the involvement of TTL or me. It is therefore not TTL's case that the MYOB records represent contemporaneous evidence of the transaction. Unquote. Ellis also pointed out that Wright's new lawyers presented an invoice in relation to the 12 IB 7 address dated 5th of December 2013, which apparently recalled the transfer of that Bitcoin address from De Morgan, one of Cray Wright's companies, to another, Denarius, for 42 million Australian dollars. However, as Ellis notes, quote, this is fatly inconsistent with the Bitcoin in that address being owned by Tulip Trading Limited, unquote. So, Arthur, to summarise here, in the entirety of this court case, which is worth billions of pounds, let's not forget, Craig Wright relied on just two pieces of contemporaneous evidence, and he has now disowned both of them. What does that say to you about his case that we didn't know already? Yeah, yeah the, the finding that these both these uh, pieces of evidence are forgeries will no doubt have consequences, because now there's no evidence uh, left. And to be fair, I had somewhat expected that a judge would uh, throw the case out by now already, and... Uh, forwarded to the next judge for a criminal fraud uh, intent uh, determination. But uh, yeah, it looks like we'll, that we'll get there, I'm pretty sure. Ontier wasn't the only law firm that Wright threw under the bus in his witness statement, blaming his Norwegian law firm for cock-ups in the Hodlenord case. Quote, As in the Kleiman claim, there were numerous instances where documents were presented as if they had come directly from me. When these documents were raised as part of the proceedings in Norway, I issued clear instructions to my Norwegian legal team to challenge the narrative around these documents and to make my position clear on their source. However, to my disappointment, my legal representatives in Norway refused to act in accordance with my instructions. This left me deeply dissatisfied with the conduct of the trial and the actions of individuals involved. My Norwegian legal counsel chose to disregard my instructions and pursued a legal strategy that diverged significantly from what I had desired and expected. This has been a source of frustration and disappointment for me as it resulted in a legal approach that did not align with my intentions or objectives." Unquote. Arthur, I'm confused. I thought it was the inexperienced judge's fault he lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was the initial uh, response, right? Yeah. Although I think it was only Kelvin Air probably that uh, stating that in uh, in public. The current stance is that all the lawyers that they hired have not been working according to Craig Wright's instruction, and Alice's uh, sixth witness uh, statement uh, had a beautiful piece of poetry about that. It's uh, called "Criticism of Norwegian and English Lawyers," and it goes like this, Mark. At paragraphs 61 and 62, Dr. Wright casts blame on his Norwegian and English lawyers for the findings of fraud and dishonesty made against him in the Granith v. Wright proceedings in Norway and Wright v. McCormick proceedings in England, whilst stating that his legal counsel acted incompetently and contrary to his instructions, he has declined to disclose any evidence that would support that contention. <laughs> In the Norwegian proceedings, Dr. Wright has not sought to overturn the outcome based on ineffective assistance of counsel. And this is telling. So you're telling me that Craig Wright blamed somebody else for something but didn't have any proof to back it up? I am shocked. That, that is shocking. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Wright also in this filing blamed Ontier for losing him the Peter McCormack case, claiming that they, quote, adamantly refused to bring forth witnesses who could corroborate, unquote, his claims to have met a key witness who said that she never heard of him. So to recap then, we have Ontier blamed for messing up the only two pieces of contemporaneous evidence in this case. We have Ontier also blamed for losing Wright the McCormack case. We have his Norwegian team blamed for his loss against Hodlenort. He really does have bad luck with attorneys, doesn't he? Um, yeah, if we have to believe his uh, stories. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> 
but of course we don't believe his stories because we have been following all these cases and we have seen how his uh, councils have been acting and because we know all these councils have to navigate uh, a lot of conflicting information i'm trying to be friendly here mark <laughs> then it's quite something to keep uh, on representing uh, craig writing court i mean imagine being constantly challenged on your ethical code of conduct and then defend someone who you are uh, certain of that he is constantly lying and providing you with false evidence i mean have you ever seen a case where a forensic expert is endorsing physical evidence from the get-go because of the reputation of a client and then this client's evidence is still being destroyed as a forgery and then basically the client blames the lawyer for it Hmm. Because that is what we see happening uh, out here, Mark. Mm -hmm. We don't see Craig having bad luck with his counsels. We see Craig making lame excuses that make no sense. It's also worth noting a few extra claims that Wright has made during these proceedings and how the developers are tackling them. The first concerns a paper version of the One Fix wallet, which was entered into evidence in the Kleiman case. Now, Craig Wright claims that the paper wallet was not advanced as evidence by him, but was instead, rather oddly, supplied by Ira Kleiman, with Wright never intending to rely on it as evidence. Arthur, how did Ira Kleiman get hold of a one fixed paper wallet? Craig says something and that explains it. As a document within the control of the claimant company WNK Info Defense LLC, it was presumed to be in my control given my role as director of that company. I had no control over any claim to the document's legitimacy and in fact attempted to inform the court in my testimony that the relevant paper wallet was not provided by me but by Ira Kleiman for WNK Info Defense LLC and I had not sought to rely on it. It is crucial to clarify that many of the documents in question had been provided by third parties and were subsequently utilized by Ira Kleiman in a manner that portrayed me in a negative light. Now, yeah, so what we see happening here is that Craig is not providing any explanation uh, who were these third parties who have been handing this presumably forged evidence to Ira Kleiman or presumably uh, genuine uh, evidence that Ira Kleiman has been turned into forgeries. We don't know who used it in the, in, in the Kleiman case. It makes you wonder if it is even true, because as far as I know, all evidence used in the Kleiman case was sourced from Craig Wright either the correspondence from the 2014 to 2017 era before the lawsuit started or evidence that was uh, requested from uh, Craig uh, during the lawsuit. Now, I figured the easiest way to get an answer to this was to ask Ira Kleiman himself. So I did that and this was his response over Craig Wright's claim. Quote, that's an easy one to disprove. The COPA attorneys could easily request a record of who produced that discovery material, which would show that I certainly didn't, unquote. So that's that one taken care of. There's also some discussion in the witness statement over the creation of Tulip Trading Limited. Now, in his witness statement, Wright claimed, again, that the emails between himself and Abacus discussing the purchase of Tulip Trading Limited in 2014 were, quote, disclosed by third-party WNK Info Defence LLC on the basis that I was a former CEO, unquote, before adding, quote, I did not disclose and did not rely on the purportedly false documents, and so any questions of authenticity are not correctly directed to me. The purported documents originated through a third-party computer that was associated with a former staff member at Hot PEPL that was imaged due to the disclosure requirements in the United States, unquote. Wright then added something else that we've come to hear a fair bit since 2018. Quote, I consider it in fact likely that Ira, Kleiman, could have falsified documents to support his claim, and noted that he had submitted evidence that showed TTL being a going concern as far back as 2009. Arthur, what did Timothy Ellis have to say about this? He notes that Craig Wright says the evidence came from a third-party computer that was associated with a former staff member of Hotwire before he indeed blames Ira Kleiman, which, and I found this pretty funny, uh, Mark, Alice doesn't believe. Similarly, untenable is the suggestion that Ira Kleiman, his opponent in the Kleiman proceedings, somehow travelled to Australia and planted forged documents on various devices owned by entities associated with Dr. Wright, an allegedly globally renowned information security expert. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Yeah. 
Now, we know that Craig Wright also says that Blockstream and other Bitcoin developers and the ATO was all in on the plan to shut his business down. So what Craig is meaning is probably that Ira Kleiman got someone else to do it for him remotely. Yeah, but this is, of course, uh, equally as, uh, as crazy. Alice also points out that Wright himself says in his fifth witness statement that TTL did not own the coins in the one fix and 12 IP7 addresses until October 2014. Alice suggests that story may have been concocted to align to his claim that the documents were falsified by Ira Kleiman. The pair were not introduced until February 2014 after all, but it is, and I quote, directly inconsistent with his earlier statement and in his second witness statement. And finally, we have this new evidence that Craig uh, has produced uh, that shows the acquisition of Tulip Trading Limited in July 2009 and the payment for it. Listeners to our podcast will know that Craig has been saying for years that he incorporated TTL in 2011. It was actually bought by him in 2014, of course. Uh, and so Alice asks, uh, why would Craig Wright pay to incorporate a company in July 2009, but not incorporated until July 2011? That's a good question. He also has this to say about the evidence itself, which we haven't yet seen. And I quote, the evidence should in the Enio defendant's view, be treated with extreme levels of caution. I understand that these documents were not disclosed in the climate proceedings or the COPA proceedings. It is very likely that they would have been disclosed if they were genuine contemporaneous documents. Now, as for what this evidence uh, is, we can only speculate, but I imagine it will be a forged bank statement and a forged invoice, uh, something like that. No. So hopefully uh, one day we will see that stuff. We need, at this point, to cast our minds back to May 2020, five months after the bonded courier had arrived, bringing with him access to the Tulip Trust Bitcoin. Or not. What he did bring was revealed that May, when Craig Wright supplied a list of around 16,000 Bitcoin addresses to the court in the Kleiman vs Wright trial, which was accompanied by the following statement. Quote, the receipt of these documents and my inspection of them allowed me to recognise the authenticity of other documents, including the list of Bitcoin public addresses, unquote. As some may remember, 145 of these addresses were signed with the message Craig Wright is a liar and a fraud shortly afterwards. Ellis referenced this in his first witness statement, which was addressed by Wright in his witness statement thus, quote, It is incorrect to suggest that this is a list produced by me for the purposes of those proceedings. I received the list of addresses in an Excel spreadsheet format from an anonymous source, with one copy posted to my address, one email to me, and another email to my wife. One email was purported to be from Dave Kleiman, but this was impossible as he had passed away. The second email purported to be from Dennis Miyaka, but upon checking with Mr Miyaka, he confirmed he was not the sender." Unquote. Arthur, this is the first time we've seen Craig Wright row back on the bonded courier story, we were told initially that it was Dennis Miyaka, but at some point in the intervening years, this story has been ditched in favour of an even more extraordinary one. The bonded courier was in fact a totally anonymous person who just sent Craig Wright and his wife multiple copies of the Bitcoin addresses owned by TTL, and he just added them into evidence. What was Ellis's reaction to this? <laughs> Yeah, this is not the first time that we hear this <laughs> lame excuse. Hmm. An anonymous people uh, just send or give him random stuff and without thinking twice, Craig is uh, throwing it into a court case. It's yeah. mad. It's mad. Yeah. <laughs> and then it turns out to be a forgery. Oh, surprise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shock horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, so I, I'm sure that Justice Miller is not going to buy this uh, lame excuse of uh, Craig Wright, of course. But no, you hope not. Nah. Now, yeah, anyway, th this is what uh, Alice had to say. I will quote again. This account is materially misleading. Dr. Wright was ordered to produce this list. Dr. Wright then swore a statement to the effect that he recognized the authenticity of the other documents, including the list of Bitcoin public addresses. It is notable that despite Dr. Wright's statement that he, and he quotes Craig Wright here, does not hold any Bitcoin personally and that all assets discussed were associated with corporate entities I ran. I must emphasize that these corporate assets and uh, uh, that these are corporate assets and not mine personally. I will further note that none of these assets has have ever been mine. Now, now we go back to uh, Alice again. 
This is itself directly contradicted by Dr. Wright's own testimony in the climate proceedings where he says the original list, speaking about the list of uh, the Bitcoin holdings, that I have of only the first 15 addresses is the basically what I mind is me. Blocks 1 to 15 are the addresses that Craig Wright mind as Craig Wright. He just can't keep a story straight, can he? Nay, never. So now we've dealt with the coins and how Craig Wright has disowned the only evidence backing up his claim to have ever owned them, let's move on to the hack itself. Wright said that his actions after the hack were, quote, entirely different, unquote, from the version Ellis put forward, despite Ellis leaning heavily on Wright's own quotes, laying out the setup that was supposedly used to protect the private keys. Wright said that his data, quote, was protected by two layers of firewalls of the strength typically employed by large corporations, unquote, but then added that, as we know, the keys were backed up on Microsoft OneDrive and Google Cloud servers. Arthur, we're perpetually told that Craig Wright is an IT security genius, and yet part of his story is that he backed up the private keys to these wallets on OneDrive and Google Cloud. I hope he's not going to go looking for jobs in the IT security sector after this, because he's just dug his own grave here, hasn't he? To be honest, there are two sides of this uh, of this story. In general, having a cloud backup strategy is not really a bad move. It is said, for example, that cloud storage often uh, offers greater protection against cyber attacks than other options because it's backed up regularly and stored off-site. It's also monitored for suspicious activity 24-7. For some situations, that sounds good. However, when we are talking about Bitcoin, eh, Bitcoin private keys, and the, the, then the common denominator says that using cloud backups is probably not the best thing to do. Because, and I quote from an online uh, source here, storing backups online can expose your private key to hacking and theft. Online storage methods such as cloud storage are susceptible to cyber attacks and data breaches, which may result in the loss of your private keys. And to avoid mistakes, use offline storage methods such as paper wallets or stainless steel. End of quote. Now, yeah, so it, it, it depends a bit on what side uh, you are on, uh, Mark. I've been an IT consultant for uh, for some 20 years, and I think both sides have uh, have good points. But given that Craig Wright was already working with paper wallets in 2013, as he claims, uh -huh, uh, that in, yeah, I mean, it, it baffles me that he stopped using these uh, methods of uh, backup, especially for only two addresses. But all in all, they contain uh, 110,000 uh, BTC. So I would have used uh, the physical ways of uh, backup, uh, good quality paper wallets, or engraved in uh, in a stainless steel uh, plate, and then store that uh, paper wallet or steel plate in uh, in a safe or or a bank vault. Well, if we're to believe another aspect of his story, that paper wallet for the one fix address is in a bank vault in Singapore. So <laughs> yeah, endorsed by uh, Stephen Matthews. Yeah. Wright says that he, quote, took necessary steps to protect other intellectual property stored on my system, unquote, following the discovery of the hack, which resulted in, quote, the reset of a single main device which held a significant amount of vital information, unquote, which he called a, quote, proportionate response to limit ongoing possible damage from malicious hackers, unquote. He added that he contacted Microsoft and Google, the first time he has said he did so, where he was, quote, offered no assistance in tracing or recovery of the digital assets." Unquote. Wright added that IP worth over $1 billion was also accessed and copied from his system, valued by himself, naturally, which he said resulted in Enchain changing its patent filing priority. This, interestingly, quote, is likely to lead to losses to a variety of companies in the Enchain group. Arthur, this is quite a statement, isn't it? Yeah, sort of, but not a really surprising one coming from the mouth of uh, Craig Wright. Mm -hmm. Of course, he is valuing his own work in the billions. And when he has billions in patents or work in progress for patents, as he's probably claiming, uh, stolen from him that were supposed to go uh, to Enchain, then yeah, Enchain is being financially uh, damaged uh, in the end. But uh, is he setting uh, Enchain up for a, a poor performance? Yeah, who knows? Also, Wright says that he tasked the N-Chain research team with monitoring patent filings that could have used his IP and nothing has been filed in three years. So the thieves apparently made off with a billion dollars in IP, but in three years they've not used a scrap of it. Do you think they just took one look and threw it in the bin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> now you know <laughs> i'm getting a virtual headache sometimes trying to imagine what might have happened <laughs> knowing that craig wright pulled this all from his behind hmm. <laughs> now yeah, what is the most likely thing uh, that happened is that craig took this uh, theft uh, opportunity to pretend that he had dozens and dozens of patents ready to send to Enchain, and now that he was robbed he can also claim that all his patent work that never existed uh, let's be clear again uh, has gone missing too but yeah playing along with his game presuming the thieves have been uh, checking the ip and patent uh, documents of course they threw it in the bin that covers the most important aspect of wright's fifth witness statement but his sixth filed on the same day added allegations made by christian agahansen at the end of september following his and wright's departures from Enchain, and which the developers used in their defense Wright claimed that, in their totality, Aga Hansen's tweets, quote, lack relevance and or evidence, unquote, to support the claim for a preliminary trial, and that, quote, in some instances, Mr. Aga Hansen clearly refers to privileged information and documents, unquote. Wright adds multiple times that he is not a member of the N-Chain board and is only an external consultant and so can't comment on certain allegations, although he does state that he has, quote, seen a copy of the whistleblower report and can confirm there is no accurate information of any value within it, unquote. Arthur, how normal is it that an external consultant sees a highly confidential whistleblowing report about a client and then references it in a lawsuit? Yeah, good one. <laughs> Now, yeah, of course, we know that Craig isn't your usual external uh, contractor. We are talking about um, September this year. He was uh, not yet an external consultant. He was still the chief uh, scientist at Enchain. And his uh, status, uh, the presumed uh, inventor of uh, Bitcoin. At that moment, that report, uh, the fairway brief, it, when it came out, it makes a lot of sense that he saw it too. So he was actually still with Enchain when that fairway brief was released. So he saw it because he was still an employee i think so i think so or did when was the fairway brief handed to the board i think Kristen presented the fairway brief on the 25th or 26th but craig was still walking around and he was still communicating with all the people in office i think he only left uh, the premises uh, around uh, the 29th I mean, it would be weird if Christian Agahansen gave him a copy of the fairway brief before they had this board meeting. So the only way he could have seen it is after he's been fired and someone's given it to him. So he still shouldn't have seen it anyway. I can imagine that, that somebody gave it to him, maybe even Christian Agahansen. That we don't know at the moment, so we cannot say much. Mm. Wright also comments on the email from Calvin Ayer to him, forwarded to Christian Agahansen by Stephen Matthews, saying, quote, To my knowledge, the email is not authentic and does not exist. It refers to facts that are not true, such as Calvin is funding the litigation. This isn't true, unquote. Arthur, if Calvin Ayer isn't paying for this lawsuit, who are the other contenders for the privilege of backing Craig Wright? To be fair, I have really no idea. If uh, Craig is trying to imply that uh, Calvin is, uh, never sponsored him, then that's a lie, of course, that we know already. Because in, in other lawsuits, uh, it was mentioned, uh, I think it was in the Peter McCormick case, that Craig admitted that Calvin uh, provided loans uh, to him for, uh, for his uh, legal uh, endeavors. But after Calvin's uh, September 23 uh, email to Craig, where he announced that he would stop sponsoring his legal shenanigans and presuming Calvin did indeed stop paying from then onward, yeah, uh, then it is true for now. As for who is putting up this money, perhaps Calvin has been talking over the fence to a neighbor about a great investment opportunity, who knows? <laughs> and what did Ellis say about these claims? Now, Alice uh, says what we already knew, uh, Mark. Kelvin Air already confirmed the authenticity of the email. And then uh, Alice says, The above denial by Dr. Wright is therefore false and must have been known to be false by Dr. Wright because Dr. Wright and his wife, Ramona Eng, are recipients of the email. And to avoid any doubt, let me remind you what uh, Kelvin said in a tweet of uh, October the 2nd uh, of this year. The letter was me trying to talk Craig into signing. Uh, there's no word about uh, anything uh, being false uh, or forged or uh, not sent uh, from this uh, email. Right around the time that Timothy Ellis was filing his witness statement, the defendants were pressing Wright for his security money. 
Having bought the case, Wright owed almost £300,000 to cover the costs of the defence in case he lost, money that was now overdue. On November the 1st, the developers were forced to write to the court to complain that Wright still hadn't paid his securities costs, offering a timetable of events to back up their claims. 19th of October. The court funds office received a cheque for the stated sum. It was rejected because the accompanying form was incomplete and the office was not provided with a sealed copy of the relevant court order. 30th of October. The payment was rejected again, this time because the claimant and defendant details were not noted on the accompanying form and because the court funds office was, again, not provided with a sealed copy of the relevant court order. 31st of October, the attempt to pay was, again, rejected because the accompanying form was not completely corrected and because the claimant and defendant details were not recorded on it. A sealed copy of the court order was received, but separately from the other documents, so it was not taken together. Wright eventually paid up a week later, but he might have wished he hadn't. On November the 29th, Justice Miller ruled that a preliminary issue trial would indeed go ahead in 2025 to determine whether or not TTL owned the coins it claimed to have lost. The trial will answer the following questions. Can and or should the court determine and or declare whether the claimant is the owner of the Bitcoin in the addresses? Does TTL own and did it own at the time of the alleged hack the Bitcoin in the addresses? Did TTL commence these proceedings knowing that it does not own the Bitcoin in the addresses? Is the claim brought by TTL fraudulent and an abusive process? Did the hack occur and deprive TTL of the private keys and the keys access material? Arthur, it's worth taking a step back at this point. Craig Wright sued the developers over the concept of fiduciary duty, hoping that he would basically cripple Bitcoin and maybe get billions of pounds on the side. And what he's ended up with is a trial where he runs the risk of being found to have brought a fraudulent case and to have perpetrated an abusive process. The best case scenario now is that he gets the trial he was expecting in the first place. And the worst case is that a judge throws the case out and very likely puts him on a contempt of court charge. Just how damaging would a loss be to him now? Yeah, as you said, losing this case at this uh, stage would be a devastating loss for Craig. Let's say he is losing uh, on all counts. That means that uh, Craig never owned uh, the Bitcoin that he claimed to own. The hack did uh, logically uh, also not occur. And then the case was uh, commenced while well, knowing that Craig slash TTL didn't own the Bitcoin. So it was a fraudulent case with uh, forgeries and bookkeeping fraud and as such a massive abuse of process with all fraudulent means possible. Mm. Now, yeah, um, here a uh, ruling of uh, Justice uh, Chamberlain uh, in the McCormick uh, libel case uh, comes to mind. Straightforwardly false in almost every material respect. Mm. Now, in United Kingdom law, this means that uh, Justice Meller uh, could sanction uh, contempt of court uh, charges against Craig Wright after ordering Craig uh, to pay a heavy fine and uh, settling uh, the legal cost of uh, the defendants. So now we have uh, two cases where Craig, if he loses badly, could be in deep uh, legal waters. Uh, this case and, uh, and of course the Copa case. The court filing also provided a list of evidence that will be included in the trial, with Wright agreeing to about 5% of what the developers want to include. These include, interestingly, quote, all the copies of any paper wallet for the one fix address in unredacted and native form, unquote. Arthur, this would be very enlightening, but it doesn't mean any are actually going to arrive, are they? Craig said in the filings that he no longer has any paper copies, surprise, surprise, and the one that made it to the Kleiman trial was submitted by Ira Kleiman, weirdly. There's a very good chance we're not actually going to see it, isn't there? Yeah, indeed. And I wonder if uh, Ira Kleiman ever uh, had a paper copy, uh, to be honest. I think Craig meant that uh, the photo evidence of a paper wallet with Craig's passport on top to give the photo more credibility, that photo, that evidence popped up during Climate versus Wright. And um, what Craig is trying to imply is that Ira created or recreated that, uh, that photo evidence. So, no, I don't think uh, that we will see any paper wallet uh, in court uh, anytime soon. CoinGeek reported the ruling by warning that proving ownership of the assets, quote, may prove more difficult than many would expect, unquote. Yeah, that'll happen when you disown your own evidence. It noted, however, that TTL's claim of ownership had, quote, already been tested rather rigorously, unquote. 
Arthur, we know that Craig Wright only accepts verdicts from courts and nothing less, so what kind of rigorous test has TTL passed? <laughs> oh yeah, that was so rigorous. Uh-huh. <laughs> what they did, they were, they were posting an, an ad, an advertorial, a quarter of a page, I think, if I remember well, in the Financial Times, and that ad was asking the reader to step forward if they thought that they are the rightful owner of the one fix address bitcoins. And because no one did, CoinGeek says then that can only mean that TTL is the legal owner of the coins. <laughs> the whole world and, and his goldfish <laughs> know that the one fix address contains 80,000 BTC stolen from Mount Gox. So what do you expect? That the thief is uh, stepping forward or something based on an <laughs> advertorial in the Financial Times? No, I don't think so. Russian hackers, they read the FT all the time. They're, they're famous for it. They can't put it down. Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> the BSV faithful lapped up the news of the preliminary trial. One respondent on Twitter called it a, quote, masterful chess move, unquote. Jesus. While one of the four people in the BSV subreddit opined, quote, and to think the opposition was ignorantly celebrating this ruling as a loss for Craig. This ruling is obviously procedural and provides TTL with the opportunity of proving that they are the rightful owners of the coins in order for the case to proceed, unquote. No, it wasn't obviously procedural. The developers asked for it, Craig Wright fought it, and lost. If Craig Wright had wanted the chance to prove ownership of the coins, he would have asked for it, and he certainly wouldn't have fought it. If there was any doubt that Wright had lost the motion, TTL was ordered to pay £266,000 in costs to the defendants, as well as further security costs of £271,000 by April 2024 for the interim phases of the preliminary trial. Arthur, these payments don't include security for the preliminary trial itself, which is slated to be 15 days in length. This case was supposed to net him billions of pounds, but he's going to rack up over a million pounds in costs and he might not even make it to the actual trial. Do you think he will run out of money before this gets any further? Yeah, well, that depends on who is now sponsoring him. And we don't know any better as that Kelvin Air is not paying the bills anymore. And then somewhere Kelvin said that Craig is still financially safe or something like that. So he made it appear that someone else took over the sponsorship from, uh, from him. So yeah... To be honest, I'm, I'm not sure what to think about all this because Calvin is a bit hard to catch uh, these days, especially about this uh, subject. He says one thing to Craig, but in public he says almost uh, the opposite. So I see it as a possibility that Calvin is still uh, throwing his money at uh, Craig Wright. Yeah, I think that's more likely than, than he's found someone else to do it at this late stage. Yeah, yeah. Another bonus of having the preliminary trial is that it strips away the chance for Craig Wright to have his soapbox from which he can bang on about how BSV is the real Bitcoin and all that guff. This is going to be purely about whether TTL can prove if it owned those coins or not. And all his arguments about Bitcoin, even about fiduciary duties, which is the heart of all this really, won't come anywhere near it. It all comes down to his evidence over this one aspect. And this is something that he definitely won't have bargained for, isn't it? No. Nope. Most certainly not, uh, Mark. If Craig had it uh, his way, his evidence should have been good enough to convince uh, the opponent and, and the judge that it was all good and, and genuine. But that's not how one should uh, deal with Craig, because he, he is a prime example for where we can uh, use the saying guilty unless proven otherwise, which is, of course, the opposite of the real saying <laughs> guilty unless proven otherwise. It's an absolute disaster for your credibility when your case is not judged on the merits, but it's first going through a trial of no less than five preliminary issues, all to determine, did the hack actually happen? Did Craig, uh, Craig even own these bitcoins? And is the case an abuse of uh, process, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So taking a step back then, it's obvious to anyone with a remotely objective outlook on this that it's been a disaster for Craig Wright. He has abandoned his only two pieces of contemporaneous evidence, like they were the illegitimate children of a 19th century baron. What evidence has he actually got left? Yeah, none, nothing. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> just the usual uh, rogues gallery of uh, witnesses. But mm. uh, to be fair, I, I have no idea how he thinks that he can win this. Mm. And we have a go at the British court system sometimes, but at least it's seen sense here and asked TTL to prove its ownership before it can continue the case. 
And on this point, the trial judge will know that Wright withdrew his own evidence, which I'm sure helped Justice Mellor in making up his mind. And that's just not going to do him any favours, is it? I don't think so. Talking about the trial judge, we see that Justice Mellor is uh, handling both the pineapple hack and the COPA cases. And we now have uh, a COPA trial starting uh, February the 5th of uh, next year. And for this pineapple hack uh, case, we know that the preliminary issues trial is not going to be scheduled in uh, 2024 anymore. So that will be early 2025. So could we have uh, Justice Mellor looking at both cases? I remember somewhere a ruling that he was hinting that he might not be the trial judge. But I, well, we will see if, if he appoints somebody else or maybe he doesn't have the time or maybe someone else is more experienced in uh, live trials uh, as he is. That I don't know. I don't know. We will see. We will see on uh, the 5th of uh, February. In the very early stages, it goes to like a master clerk and then it gets assigned to the judge, like in, in the Copa case, it's Justice Mellor and the copyright cases, I think, as well. I, I think from this point, if there's been a judge assigned to it, I think it stays with him. It's either really normal that he's looking after all of Craig Wright's UK cases, um, apart from the Hodlin libel trial, or it's really, really odd that he's got them. But I think the fact he's looking after all of them makes me think that this is standard practice um, because... Like I say, once it's got to this point, I don't think someone of his standing deals with these early stages to then pass it on to someone. I think we're at that point. So I do think there's a chance we could have him presiding over every Craig Wright trial, barring the Hodlinort libel trial, which is extraordinary. Well, that's it for this update. We'll be back in 2024 if there are any major developments, which there are almost bound to be. And all being well, we'll also be back in 2025 for a verdict. Arthur, it's been a pleasure as always. Yeah, same here, Mark. And uh, I'll see you for the next one. Yes, sir. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dr. Bitcoin, the man who wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice to get these episodes the moment they drop. And if you enjoyed what you heard, we'd really appreciate a star rating and even a review to help us get this out to as many people as possible. Our monthly bonus episodes are available to download from our website for a small consideration. And if you'd like to access all these bonus episodes, plus these monthly updates a few days early and other goodies, you can do so by becoming a Dr. Bitcoin supporter See the details in the show notes for information on how to do this or head to our website, drbitcoinpod.com. That's drbitcoinpod.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at drbitcoinpod and you can email us at drbitcoinpod at gmail.com. That's drbitcoinpod at gmail.com. Thanks very much for listening and we'll speak to you again soon. You've been listening to Dr. Bitcoin. The Man Who Wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto. Written by Mark Hunter, with additional material by Arthur Van Pelt. Editing and production by Mark Hunter. This has been a Contented Media Production.